Uh, before I introduce our next panel on the policy of plastics, I would like to first of all share the following message with you from Senator Whitehouse from Rhode Island, who unfortunately cannot be here with us in person today. Hi, I'm Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. I'm sorry I can't be there with all of you at MIT today. One second. But I want. I just need to drag it over. <laughs> Hi, I'm Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. I'm sorry I can't be there with all of you at MIT today, but I want to thank the MIT Water Club for its focus on ocean plastics at this year's summit and for giving me the opportunity to say a few words. Though the oceans cover over 70% of Earth, they're often taken for granted. Each year, around 8 million metric tons of plastic waste enters the sea from land. By 2050, if we do nothing, estimates show the weight of the plastic in our oceans will equal the weight of the fish in our oceans. And once plastics enter the ocean, they never fully degrade. They tangle, they trap, they drown, and they kill, and they become smaller and smaller pieces that travel the globe on ocean currents ultimately entering our human food chain. Plastic is now ubiquitous on our beaches, in our oceans, ingested by and entangled around wildlife, even in the tap water, seafood, salt, and other foods humans consume. Plastic waste has been found on remote islands, in deep sea sediments, and in sea ice. An international research expedition even found chunks of plastic littering the North Pole. There is strong congressional interest in solving our ocean trash problem. As co-chair of the Senate Oceans Caucus, a bipartisan group of 41 senators, I made marine debris a priority. Last October, with the energetic support of Senator Sullivan from Alaska getting our Save Our Seas Act passed, I got to witness it signed into law by the president. The bill has boosted the federal government's domestic and international response to cleaning up marine debris and encouraged cooperation between the United States and other nations to tackle the crisis worldwide. More important, the success of Save Our Seas was such a great experience for everyone that Senator Sullivan and I, along with Senator Menendez of New Jersey, introduced a bigger, better, bipartisan Save Our Seas 2.0 Act earlier this year. This bill has already been approved by two Senate committees and will hopefully receive support from a third by the time you see this video. Save Our Seas 2.0 builds on the success of the first bill, reducing the creation of plastic waste, finding uses for the plastic waste that already exists, making capturing it before it gets to the sea a priority, and continuing momentum toward a global solution to this problem. More needs to be done. We have abused and ignored our oceans for too long. The ocean's warnings are very clear. If data could scream, the oceans would be screaming their warnings. We can't afford to ignore them any longer. I'm very grateful to the MIT Water Club for organizing this year's summit. summit keep up the good work. Right. We you, would Senator. like to thank Senator Whitehouse for his insights and visions on the topic. I think that was a great introduction to the topic of policy. In this panel, we will explore both successes and challenges in developing policy to promote sustainable water and plastic practices. The panel would be moderated by Cherry Gao, who is a current PhD student in biological engineering studying bacteria in the ocean and their relationship with the climate. She has also worked with uh, a prior company, Patagonia, on sustainable solution for food packaging as a winner of um, the Patagonia case competition earlier this year. So I will now give the floor up to Cherry. All right, thank you so much, Cindy, for the introduction. So as said by Professor John Fernandez in the last speech, we can't wait for policy until the last minute. So this is a great segue into our current panel discussion. 
Um, so I'd like to start off this panel discussion by inviting each of you to give uh, an introduction about yourself uh, of duration eight to 12 minutes. So, okay, I think Diana, you're first. Okay. Hi everybody, I'm Diana Cohen. I'm a co-founder and the CEO of Plastic Pollution Coalition. We are a global coalition. We're made up of 1,200 organizations and businesses and notable coalition members around the world who are all working to stop plastic pollution and to raise awareness about the toxic impact uh, of plastic and the chemicals in plastic on human health, animal health, the ocean and waterways, and the environment. Um, I am based in Los Angeles, California, but our core team is spread out across the United States, and we work with groups that are coming out of 60 different countries on six continents. I thought it would be nice actually today to just start out my presentation by sharing a short video piece with you guys. Plastic Pollution Coalition is an associate producer of a new film that is coming out soon. It's showing in film festivals right now. It was made by The Story of Stuff and the director, Dea Sloshberg. <laughs> Sloshberg, and it's called The Story of Plastic. So I'd like to just show a short vignette from that, which is focused on a project that I found really remarkable a few years ago when I had a chance to visit it in the Philippines. So it's in Manila. Could we show that? Let's see if it shows up. All right. Plastics are treated as a product that miraculously appears from nowhere, and it goes to nowhere. Plastics it are treated when as the oil a and product the gas that the miraculously has. appears from nowhere, and it, keeps and it on goes being a problem at every stage along the way. It starts when the oil and the gas leave the wellhead, and it keeps on being a problem at every stage along the way. Why is it that we're seeing so much more plastics entering the environment? This is the story of plastics. Adrian, can you actually start it again? It's a product that miraculously appears from nowhere, and it goes to nowhere. It starts when the oil and the gas leave the wellhead, and it keeps on being a problem at every stage along the way. Why is it that we're seeing so much more plastics entering the environment? This is the story of plastics. If we see waste simply as an infrastructure issue, it will never work. In a zero waste system, it's always people-centered. We always work with the communities. We believe in the power of the communities to solve their own waste problem, if only given the right support to actually do it. And that is why we began to work with cities in the Philippines. When we talk about zero waste cities, these are cities working towards zero waste. That is a goal. In a decentralized model, what we use are push carts, for example, and this allows us to go to each household and make sure that waste is collected at household level. The moment you provide waste pickers and waste collectors, the moment you provide a consistent schedule of collection with the right segregation bins, for example, all of our households comply, meaning the people want to do it. But the basic thing is, number one, we're ensuring that all waste are collected. Number two, that all organics are managed through composting on site. The third thing is that we're able to recover as much recyclable waste as possible, as much paper, as much metal, as much plastic as possible. So the fourth point is that even in our zero waste models, they're able to reduce their waste by 7 to 8%, and still they're left with about 20 to 30% waste, residual waste that they can neither compost nor recycle. But the beauty of a zero waste program is that we are not hiding these products. The zero waste program allows us to identify which products are beyond the capacity of communities to manage, which allows us then to engage the right people 
in this case, corporations who are producing these products and packaging to either eliminate, redesign, or think of alternative delivery systems. Because if one community cannot manage it, one city cannot manage it, maybe the reality is that it's not manageable. The only way for us to address a specific product that is problematic is to not create it in the first place. We have tried to work with some corporations to address this problem, but what do they tell us? At this point, they're not made responsible for that. And that is what we want to change, that companies should stop that mindset that their responsibility ends when they sell it. They have to be responsible for the entire life cycle of the products that they produce. The solution cannot come from here, it has to come from the headquarters. These are typically in the US and in Europe. My vision for the future is all cities are going zero waste. After they've implemented the zero waste program, you can see the difference, you can smell the difference, you can feel the difference. So I wanted to, I wanted to uh, share that short piece that's just one of the vignettes from this feature film that's coming out soon. Um, and the reason I wanted to share that is I'm a very solution-oriented person, and I'm constantly looking for the solutions that we can not only bring about at the local level, uh, but also solutions we can bring about at the national, federal level, or at the uh, international level. And there's a lot of interesting movement right now happening around us. I just want to highlight a few of the um, big successes, although I'm sure that'll be part of our conversation. Um, one is that you know, the European Union recently banned single-use plastics, and they've got a phase-out program for them, but it's very, very ambitious. And they're gonna be looking at all different kinds of food packaging, but mainly to-go packaging, uh, pl plastic to-go packaging and polystyrene to-go packaging, plastic utensils, plastic straws, plastic cups, plastic bags. So I think that that's really exciting and really ambitious. And I'd like to see us emulate some of that in the US and in other countries. The city of Berkeley, and I'm from Southern California, but in Northern California, they've also passed one of the most comprehensive foodware ordinances in the world a few months ago, actually earlier this year. And that also has a phase in, uh, phase out, uh, phase, out, phase in uh, timeline to it of a few years. But they are also looking at getting rid of single use plastic packaging for foodware, um, food packaging, plastic utensils, plastic straws, plastic bags, et cetera. Um, those are both really exciting. There's also something happening, which is an amendment to the Basel Convention at the um, international level, which is that countries like uh, many countries in the global south, but in Southeast Asia, including Vietnam and Cambodia um, now and Thailand, have the ability, if they want to, to say no to receiving uh, shiploads full of plastic packaging and waste from uh, which have been shipped by the United States, Canada, Great Britain, and Europe. So we're watching some of that happen in the news right now. It's pretty exciting and interesting um, to empower those countries to say no, because many of them, just as in the United States, many cities and towns have no infrastructure to process these materials. And then I think the main thing I would like to say um, for my introduction portion is that um, we're really working to shift the way that we perceive these materials, but specifically, my focus is around plastic. Uh, not, by not calling it, by no longer calling it debris, marine debris, rubbish, waste, garbage, or litter. It's a valuable material, but we don't treat it that way, and we don't design things with it in that way. And I think we need a massive system shift. Uh, to change our way of thinking and look at all things as valuable materials so that we uh, design and conceive of the packaging for our food and beverage and beauty products, et cetera, with it in a more uh, thoughtful, comprehensive way, holistic way. So that's, that's me, that's us. Thank you, Deanna. Sure. I'm gonna pass it on to Terry. Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you to the MIT Water Club for inviting me to participate this afternoon. This is great. I, I'm uh, the, currently the deputy director of the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, 
And I don't know how many of you folks have been to Rhode Island. Hopefully you've all heard of Rhode Island. It's only about 50 miles from here, uh, straight south. But we are the smallest state in the union. Um, we have about 1,000 square miles, 1,200 square miles. We have four, 400 miles of coastline, though. And our entire geography is centered on Narragansett Bay. So people really are, are part of the ocean. They feel uh, one with the ocean. Its nickname is the Ocean State. We have a million people. Um, we have one very um, populated sort of metro center around Providence with a couple of other cities that are part of that metro center, and then a very rural western part of the state. I've been working for DEM for 33 years in the regulatory world, and my current responsibilities include clean air, clean water, waste management, site cleanup, and a lot of our technical assistance programs. So one of the big things I wanted to talk about this afternoon is whenever you start to really look at a new government regulatory model focused on a material like plastics, you have to realize it's a process. And it's a process that's very dynamic, very organic, and sometimes it takes longer than you think it's going to take. And, and I'll tell you a little bit about how that's been playing out in Rhode Island. This uh, plastics was definitely a point of conversation for a long time. But about three years ago, it really started to, to get on everybody's front, um, front burner. And some of the things that happened were a lot of our environmental groups, the Sierra Club, the Audubon, Conservation Law Foundation, Save the Bay, started to get really energized about the plastics problem. Certainly, Senator Whitehouse, who is from, from Rhode Island, has been a leader in, in ocean health. And he holds an Environmental and Ocean Leaders Day every day in the state, where this has been, this has been a main part of that agenda. The real tipping point, though, I think came uh, two and a half years ago when the Volvo Transoceanic Ocean Race made its only North American stop in Newport, Rhode Island. Now, the Volvo Ocean Race is a big deal. And when it stops at a place, it's a big party. And, and, it, and Newport is a great place to party if you've, uh, if you've never been there. It's the sailing center of, of the United <laughs> States, at least. Um, but what they do is, is not only do the crews come in, repair their boats, and, um, and kind of replenish and, and reinvigorate themselves, but they hold something called an ocean summit at each one of the stops. And the, the theme of the ocean summit two years ago was turning the tide on plastics. And there was actually a boat in the race that was called turning the tide on plastics. And as host community, we had to do something along the lines of that theme. So a bunch of us got together, kind of brainstormed. We didn't really have much going on. But what we did is we worked with our marine trades organization and our marinas, and we decided to start there. They are on the front lines of people interfacing with the water a lot of times. So they developed an education program, a certification program, and a sort of like a self-inspection program that focused on eliminating single-use plastics from all marina operations. Yay. Yeah. And we called it the, the Zero Marina Initiative. Woo. And we talked about that at the Ocean mm -hmm. Summit. Um, it, it really got the marinas excited. It got their clients excited. And it started a real good dialogue. So with every big event like this, of course, the governor goes to the event. And when she got down there, she started hearing everybody talking about plastics, realized what the magnitude of the problem. And about a month after the Volvo Ocean Race left Newport, she signed an executive order creating a task force on tackling plastics for the state. That's great. And the task force was a bear, let me tell you. There were about 40 people on this thing, and they represented business, they represented environmental groups, they represented government, and they rep represented academia. And I don't think any two people in the room had the same interests. It was, um, it was a really interesting discussion. We met for about eight months, and the biggest takeaway was a recommendation to come up with a statewide ban on single-use plastic bags. And there was legislation proposed out of that, and unfortunately, the legislation didn't pass. And that's, that's not unusual a lot of times. You'll get 
the first time through a legislative process, you get a lot of education, you get a lot of discussion, you understand where the people are coming from, and then it'll pass in a subsequent session. And we're hoping that something will come through this spring. But we also, we did, it wasn't just a one-trick pony. We also focused a little bit on this concept of leading by example. And we wanted to take the, the lessons learned in the Zero Marina partnership and extend that out to any other business that wanted to, uh, to participate. We also wanted to extend it out to events. So if we could get big events like the Newport Jazz Festival, the Newport Folk <laughs> Festival, the CVS Charity Golf Classic, all of these giant events that occur in Rhode Island, if we could get them to eliminate single-use plastics, it starts to send a message to all the people that go to those events. Oh, yeah. And that, that's been done. Um, we're starting to get more and more certification. We're trying to, to extend the lead by example into state procurement. There's huge power in government procurement, but let me tell you, moving the needle on that beast is tough. There's, there's a lot of really entrenched um, processes and habits that are built into that system. And it's not just sta changing a standard and then hoping everybody complies. It's, it requires a lot of groundwork. So we're working on that too. Um, we're really optimistic about the upcoming legislative session where we expect there will be a bag ban um, debated. We expect there will be a polystyrene ban debated. We expect there will be a straw ban debated. And we expect that there will be a Mylar balloon ban debate, debated. Awesome. Um, about half of the municipalities in Rhode Island have ordinances that already do this. So it, it, the value to business is that we're not just, we're not, we're not leading out of the blocks with a ban we're offering them statewide consistency. And that, that's how we're selling it. And I think some businesses speak that language. They understand that if they're gonna do business in the state, they would rather not have 39 different rules, which are, that's how many municipalities we have. They would like one system that they could comply with. Mm -hmm. But of course, they want that system to be done their way. And that's the debate that's going on right now. So I think I'll leave it with that and we can move on. Thank you. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much, Terry. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hand it over to Hauke. Uh, it, yeah. Thank you. Thank you um, to the organizers for inviting me to participate here. And, and thanks to all of you for being part of this summit. I think it's a really important topic. My, Background is in marine engineering and in economics, and I work at the Marine Policy Center at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, which is sort of on the way almost to Rhode Island from here. <laughs> uh, and uh, my, well, the focus of my work in the area of plastics has been on microplastics in the ocean. Mm. But what I'm going to say applies also to, to the larger pieces. Um, one of the key points here, and I'm sure this has been made before, in this summit is that we don't really understand the magnitude of the problem when it comes to plastics in the ocean today. You heard Senator Whitehouse allude to 8 million tons of plastics entering the ocean each year, something like that. We can't today account for even 10% of that when we look for plastics in the ocean. So, there's a big mystery about the transport and fate of plastics in the ocean, how they actually degrade, how they get moved around, what ends up where, and for how long. And when we read the news today about uh, study after study coming out finding microplastics in just about every organism in the ocean uh, and in us, I think you have to say that there's a lot about this that we don't yet understand. And if there's a silver lining or good news to it, it's that we don't seem to be uh, suffering from any severe health effects as a consequence of this, at least not that we know about yet. So I think from a policy perspective, I come at it from a, a, an economic point of view that sees microplastics pollution as one of a set of potentially serious challenges that we face. And we have to figure out what kind of resources to allocate to solving each of those within a more or less constrained 
uh, total budget that we have to allocate to these things. And so I think the first thing to note about this is that there is, and I don't mean to sound self-serving here, but there is a very clear case for a lot more investment in research to really understand what is going to be the consequence of these microplastics in the marine environment. Uh, that's one thing. I think there's also a clear case that can be made already for the sort of efforts to constrain the production of plastic waste, especially to the extent that it ends up going into the environment in one fashion or another. And there's probably a clear case that can be made for educating people on a broad scale to reduce single-use plastic consumption. And that can happen both at the scale of consumer choices and at the corporate level and the development of alternatives to single-use plastics. I think this is something, and maybe we'll come back to this later, that's easier to do when you're uh, in a wealthy society with lots of alternatives, like we all are here. It's more complicated in other places in the world where I've done some work where single-use plastics are a more important part of what people use to conduct their daily lives than it is for us. So uh, it's complicated, but I think um, I'll show just a couple of, of slides to illustrate some of the points that I'm making. First, the, the economic importance of plastics, and I'm sure this has been discussed at the summit already, is Im immense. And we may not like every use of plastics that we come across, but a lot of it has value to society. The, we use plastics in many instances in ways that save substantial weight, for example, in things that we move around. And if we go to alternatives there that aren't carefully thought through, we may end up using a lot more fuel, or energy anyway, to move those things around. And so uh, we should approach this carefully. The second is the point I already made about opportunities costs what is the relative importance of the plastics challenge in the context of all the other things that critically need our attention in the world today, starting with climate and working all the way down? To some extent, plastics and climate are linked. But there are lots of things that demand our attention, and, and we should be carefully uh, thinking about how much to allocate to what. And finally, when we try to solve a problem let's say, like microplastics in the ocean, uh, we need to think carefully about what is the, really the most cost-effective way of getting at that problem. Uh, because there's a range of steps we can take, some of which have a very different cost-benefit uh, balance than others. And the way, uh, for those of you who work in economics, economists tend to think about this is something like this, a very simplistic sketch here. If you imagine that the microplastics in the ocean today are creating damages, and those damages can be valued in some way, then we can reduce those damages with policy measures to reduce the, the uh, amount of microplastics in the ocean. The more we try to reduce them, the more we have to spend in resources to accomplish that. And somewhere along that continuum of policy responses, of things that we can do, there is some more or less optimal point where it, it makes sense to spend up to that amount, but probably not beyond, at least not until we solve some of the other critical environmental and ecological problems and, and human health issues and so on around the world. So that's my take on this. And I look forward to the conversation later. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hauke. Yeah, next, uh, I'll hand it over to Isaiah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stand up. I think I'm a little bit more comfortable. But I did want to start by saying thank you for being here. And thank you, MIT, the water, MIT water, and this summit. Amazing so far. But these are my favorite ones, for sure. Why? <laughs> 
because we're more humans. So I want to reach out to you in a more humane way. And I want to start by saying public policy versus private policy. In my humble opinion, governments have failed us. Otherwise, we wouldn't be standing here in such a mess at the brink of the sixth largest mass extinction and the point of no return. We are putting in danger the future generations, your children's children, your children's children, children. So what are we talking about? We're talking about humanity. We're talking about survival. And this is why I think it's so important that we touch base uh, on this today. So let me tell you first a little bit about me. So among many things, uh, I became a diplomat actually by invitation. I'm an international lawyer, investment star arbitrator, and um, I was invited by my country. I'm from Venezuela, that country that used to be incredibly uh, wealthy and, uh, and productive, now is completely destroyed, uh, and, uh, and, and in the worst humanitarian crisis this hemisphere has ever faced. But in 2017, I started at the UN, they invited me, the, the Security Council, Beautiful, things that we could do. I said, I've been an environmental activist for 30 years. When I reached the United Nations, I said, what are we gonna do now? The first report, Secretary General's report on the oceans and marine debris and plastics and microplastics. So when we started looking at those figures, I imagined, what can I do? So I started pushing every meeting I went to, I picked up the floor and the first thing I said was, how can we try to implement policy from here if we're still drinking eight ounces water bottles. So can we not teach by example? And I wanted to share with you this, if we could please turn that on. This is one of the meetings, I think it's the last one on the IPCC, and I want you to see how it started. <laughs> We'd like to stress that it's very clear that la land-based activities contribute to marine pollution and also to climate change. This is undeniable. If we cannot reflect the need to change at the United Nations, how can we ask the world to do so? Having said that, small actions bring about big changes. Eight ounces water bottles are a threat to our oceans. Single-use plastics are poison to our environment, such as straws, cups, shakers, water bottles, etc. We do kindly request to forbid the use of these bottles from conferences and teach by example. Refilling bottles will reduce marine debris and also will help mitigate climate change as well. We can only change the world by changing ourselves. And this is the power of oneness. We need less words and more actions. So, Nora. Nora, normal diplomat, right? 193 countries are sitting right there looking at me, what are you talking about? Every time we started, I took the floor, and this is by, we need to understand that we have to do whatever it takes with whatever we have, wherever we are. Otherwise, there's not gonna be any change. Don't expect the government to solve your problems. We have to solve our problems. So, after this happened, and of course, they were shooting students in the street in Venezuela. I, of course, had to resign publicly, denounce uh, the president then, Nicolás Maduro, and 20 officials to the inter International Criminal Court. I was persecuted, death threats, took political asylum. But before that, I actually had um, applied to Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Because I do believe government when we, people like-minded like us, that really care for the future of our children, we take power, that's when public policy is gonna change. Right now it's reactive policy. But what we need is actually individual, personal, emergency policy. And it's about the choices that we make, the things that we buy, what we use and what we eat. And we'll see about that a little bit there. So when uh, I went back last year, I found that they actually uh, were able to ban single-use plastics inside the United Nations. Yeah. So it, it works. Dedication, push, thrive, keep going at it. Never give up. So once I resigned, I was uh, inside my apartment like a lion, cage lion. I didn't know what to do, right? So I said, how can I keep my work that I was doing at the United Nations? So I created 
not my NGO, it's yours. It's at the NGO, it has to be for everybody else. And I started with this idea. Well, I was there for the adoption of the 2030 Sustainable Agenda. I was there for the adoption of the Paris Agreement Climate Change. I was there for the Oceans Conference. And let me tell you this, the Convention of the Law of the Sea, which ha has almost 100% of all the countries in the world, Venezuela is not part of it. And I was elected as vice chairman of the Ocean Conference of the, <laughs> of the Convention of the Law of the Sea. So what could I do by myself, locked in that room, right? I started writing out, and I actually became friends with Sea Legacy, who has two incredible uh, national uh, geographic renowned photographers, and they joined uh, on the idea on how are we gonna tackle climate change. So we started, you know, they uh, donated some of their photographs, we worked on it, and we actually created what is called the Earth Club. And the Earth Club, was its first, its first target was, then how are we gonna reach, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the COP23 at that time? And this is for climate change. So the idea was mostly, I believe the Paris Agreement is a great start, but it did not include individuals or corporations. So that was our petition. Our first petition was, what, please include individuals and corporations in the climate uh, uh, summit and conference. And so this year, last year, the uh, prime minister of Fiji, actually, he was the presiding uh, chairman at the uh, IPCC, and what he did was the Talanoa Dialogue. So he invited individuals and corporations. So once again, a small petition, boom, a huge result. So don't give up. We do have the power. And why do we have the power? Well, before we get into the power of the people, I just wanted to show you a small documentary that we actually did inside the United Nations with uh, a producer who I met before and on a bar. And I said, listen, man, can you want to change the world? He's like, what do you mean? Well, let's do a documentary on what plastic is doing. And that started because we said, what do you want to drink? I said, a whiskey, no straw for me. And he's like, why don't you want a straw? I started with the whole thing. This is what is happening, eight to 12 million times. He said, okay, okay. I, he said, I, I want to change the world. I wrote to him every week, two years after, exactly before the ocean conference, he calls me, do you still want to do it? I say, what, you want to change the world? Yeah, okay, I got the director. So we made this very small micro documentary, please. Next page. <coughs> oh, sorry. sorry, here we go. I clicked it. It's called The Last Straw. Why are straws a problem? It's a global crisis, something that affects us all and something no one wants to talk about. This material that's essentially designed to last forever for products that are meant to be thrown away after a couple of minutes. Well, you know what? It's never gonna go away. We've grown this culture around throwaway plastics. Just use it one time and then throw it away. Less than 10% of the plastics used in the world are recycled. They end up in landfills. They end up in our oceans, or worse. 32 million tons a year, which winds up in the environment, and about 8 million tons winds up in the ocean. That's the equivalent of five plastic shopping bags filled with garbage for every foot of coastline in the world. Straws cannot be recycled, most definitely. The fact that one straw stays in the environment for over 200 years and you use that straw for maybe five minutes. Every day there are enough straws that get used to wrap around the entire planet twice. There's a straw right back there. Eight, nine, there's one. Now the real irony of all this is, there are trash cans all along. Double whammy, you get a straw that's in its own wrapper. And this is what we collected, floating in the water. And what happens to plastic when it gets in the environment? That can get eaten by fish, and then we eat the fish. I think we have to stop talking about recycling so much. We need businesses, we need government, we need individuals to change the way that we do things. Because we have the power to change. It sucks. Every time we suck on a straw, 
We're sucking the life out of our oceans. We must change now. Thank you guys, that was a, a huge effort. But we were able to premiere that small micro documentary at the Ocean Summit at the United Nations. So what do you know? Just refuse plastics and maybe you can achieve many things. We are addicted to plastic though. Everything around us, it's the standard. So what are we gonna do about it? Whatever it takes, please take that message with you. And I wanna say that because in 1997, the declaration on the responsibility of the present generations toward future generations, everybody that is sitting right here right now has the huge responsibility towards future generations. So what we don't do now, it's gonna affect them all. And why? You can see why. They started preservation of life on Earth, protection of the environment, common heritage of humankind or the uh, global commons, and what's very important is to be able to bequeath uh, uh, the, uh, for future generations a planet that is not irreversibly damaged. How did that came to happen? Again, individual private policy. The Cousteau Society, Jacques Cousteau, those of you who have ever uh, been diving, you, when you use that uh, uh, Apollon in your back, he invented that. This guy was 30 days underwater. Commander Cousteau had a, a TV show. Every Wednesday I watched it when I was growing up that was underwater. So how, why do we love the oceans? This guy, by himself with his NGO, collected four million signatures for a petition. A petition that was then translated into 19 different languages in 76 countries. There's him with his son. And then, as you can see here, they brought it to UNESCO and UNESCO took it out to their board and it was approved. Now who of the people sitting here knew that this existed? I didn't know until his, actually his grandson was telling me, we have to relaunch it. So this is a fair action we're, we're doing today. We're relaunching right here, right now, this declaration. So wherever you go, remember that you have this responsibility. Then afterwards, the second action. We didn't know what to do, so how are we gonna stop this from happening? So the problem, to eight to 10 million, we already heard about it, so we need to change our behaviors. And how are we gonna do that? Maybe we're interested, we can do an effort, but we, know, we need to do it in a volume, massive way. How can we do that? By rewarding people to change their behaviors. So rewarding people to change their behavior by paying them to heal the world through their actions and in actions valued and certified by responsible producers, companies, outlets, commercials, and then for, to meet and converge with responsible consumers like yourself. So if you're able to match what you buy or what you use or what you, you eat with a certification from an exchange house that will certify that you're doing that, we are able to reach in a gamification application the idea that people can exchange their actions for goods and services through credits. It's a cashless app that rewards people to change their behavior. And I think, and I would like to invite any of you, because these are the brightest minds around on Earth right here, right now, can you help me out? All I want to do is a pilot project. If you guys are ready, please reach out to me. But these are the results that we will get from avoiding plastic consumption. Increase local awareness and the engagement to change consumers. Uh, the second one, stop plastic from reaching waterways. Engage new audiences seeking solutions and educate about alternatives to single-use plastics. I understand hemp is now being used, fish, it's also, fish scales are also used for producing alternatives uh, for plastic. So, the third thing that's gonna happen today is that since I was there and I participated on the, it's called the BB&J, Protection of Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction. 
So I was saying, it's protection of biodiversity. Why are we discussing on uh, 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 marine genetic resources? How are we protecting them by exploiting them? Okay, the second thing, what about marine protected areas? Well, it should be 100%. What are you talking about? It's like 4%. No, 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 no. It should be 100% and then maybe delineate which other areas it can be used. But right now, only 3% of our oceans is under protection, some kind of protection. 97%, it's lawless. They do whatever they want. That's why we have an overfishing problem, an illegal and unreported fisheries. That's why this can become a food security for future generations. And not only that, what about the plastic? So we can tell easily that if you want to fix the problems of the oceans, we have to reach inland. So that this right now, the last chapter of the law of the sea is gonna be on that, and none of this is there. So, I want to show you by, uh, Fletcher actually did an incredible report, and these are some of the problems in the ocean. We're only talking today about plastic, right? But even if, you, if you've heard already all these things, and uh, certainly during yesterday and today, but now, what I do think we can do, it's use our right to petition. The right to petition is what actually makes us who we are. We the people, we the peoples of the world, this is how the US Constitution starts, and this is how the Charter of the United Nations starts. So it means sovereignty is based on the power of the people. They represent us, it's not the other way around. So what we need to do is petition the United Nations to have st st stronger governance of the ocean. And today, if I may, Rose is around here, please could you share the, uh, the petition? I want to invite you to sign in any of those links, or please just sign there and we'll do it for you. Because we need to petition to have stronger. For what? So this is what we're looking for. Creating 50% of the ocean under marine protected areas, I want it 100%. Track and traceability systems for every fishing vessel, certification for fisheries product, and for enforcement inland of regulatory measures, taxes to ban plastic pollution under a moratorium. So I agree completely with Diane. It is a currency, the plastic economy. If we can use plastic and understand that we can bring it back, but we need to stop producing it. Fossil fuels and plastic is the same thing, but whatever is already circulating, we should be compelled to demand that they use the same raw materials or substitute it for something else. And then substitution of plastic for biodegradables, of course. Uh, I think we're missing there the most important one, which is actually on the other, uh, I think I missed a, a point there, but it is we need to reduce carbon production by 45% by 2030. And that impacts the ocean, impacts us all, and I think it's part of the whole idea. If we're condemning plastic, we have to go all the way to fossil fuels. For most of history, mankind has had to fight nature to survive. In this century, he, she is beginning to realize that in order to survive, we must protect it. And these are the words of Jacques Cousteau in 1956 a great environmental leader. This is my last, uh, thank you guys, I appreciate it. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Thank you so much to the panels, panelists for being here and for the introductions. You can, as you can see, we have a pretty diverse set of people and definitely felt some heat up here. <laughs> <laughs> so my job today as a moderator is to try to be a little more controversial around this topic um, in order to take the maximum advantage of this powerful panel that we have. So in the past few years, I've seen a lot of regulations around banning plastic bags, banning straws, microbees, and styrofoam containers in some municipalities. And I feel a lot of pressure myself as a citizen of society to change my behavior. But I have a hard time convincing myself actually that my small actions are having actually an impact when there's giant plastic tubing under our feet at a volume of scale that's bigger than um, 
anything that I can use within my lifetime. So according to you, panelists, were these regulations actually successful at, um, at achieving a more sustainable uh, existence of humanity? I'll start off. I think they are. Um, there is a, it really sends a message to the, to the consumer that when, when, you're, when government is sending a message that, uh, that plastic bags or straws or polystyrene is an unacceptable product for the environment, people will comply. People will get it. And like I said before, we have about half of our municipalities have ordinances in place right now that prevent the use of single-use bags. There's not a lot of enforcement, to be honest with you. There's not police that go out and check on the stores to make sure that they're, they're not using single-use bags. The stores are doing the right thing. The customers have adopted to it. There's been no real pushback. And, it, and it's eliminated a lot of that unnecessary uh, material in, a, in the... Uh, in commerce in Rhode Island. The, the, uh, whenever you are regulating, though, and especially when you're regulating against the economics of, of a situation, so, so if, if a paper bag or, or a reusable bag is that much more expensive than what you're, you're getting for free at, with a single-use plastic bag, it's tough. It's tough to change behavior that way. Um, there's also a situation where you're regulating against people's habits, long ingrained habits. It's tough to change behavior on that. A lot of people like to go into a bar and order their scotch with a straw. And, and to take that away to them from them is a, uh, is a big deal. And, um, and it's just changing people's mindset, changing people's behavior, making sure they understand the ramifications of what's going on. And then things kind of fall into place. I feel like we've seen really great results with ban uh, countries and cities where we've enacted bans. And if it makes you feel any better, by the way, it's Terrence. Terry. Terry. Yeah. Terry, if it makes you feel better, like in, in California, we banned plastic bags or we tried to ban them. We weren't successful. We tried again. We weren't successful. We did it slowly, town by town, mm -hmm. city by city. I think we had to pass about 170 or 177 of them across the state before we had success with a plastic bag ban for the state. And then when that happened, we got pushed back from the plastic industry and they held it up for 14 months, the implementation of it. So it had to come up as a bill again with another bill that was really confusing. So then we had to deal with it one more time and then it passed. And we're still, you can still go into a market in California and see lots of plastic and lots of plastic bags, mm -hmm. but it's a beginning. So, I know that the country of Rwanda is a little more zealous than we are, and they enacted their ban for plastic bags in 2008 um, and had great success with that, and it really helped clean up the environment in the country. Uh, they also um, regulate it pretty <coughs> severely. And I have friends who have traveled to Rwanda, and they arrive in Kigali or on the border, and I'll get a text from them saying, Wow, they just went through my suitcase and took away my plastic baggie that I had to use when I came through Heathrow. You know, like they just confiscate them. So, so they're a little more hands-on about it. But but I think that banning plastic bags or banning plastic straws or adding a tax to those things and then incentivizing reusables for people. We've seen a lot of great success with that. It helps shift behavior. And um, and it's beginning. It's just a beginning. It's like a as my friend Jackie Nunez, who founded The Last Plastic Straw, would say, you know, plastic straws are just a gateway. As soon as you begin to realize you don't really need a plastic straw, most people don't really need a plastic straw, it opens your eyes to all these other kinds of single-use plastics, which, frankly, in my childhood, we didn't use. So they're, they're relatively new. Sure. I, I'd like to start by saying that not everything that's legal is always ethical, and not always what is ethical is legal. So look in the past, slavery, for example. Look at it now. I would compare it with uh, fossil fuels. So let's, let's try to understand that, first of all, yes, of course, it makes a huge difference. But why are they doing it? Because we're pushing them to do it. So it is our responsibility, again, we need to change ourselves to be able, then, to bring public policy. But absolutely, it makes an incredible change, yes. 
Mm. I'm wondering if uh, an alternative strategy to regulating consumer-facing products like plastic bags is regulating industry. How could, do you have any thoughts on that? I think it's got to come from both directions, ultimately. And I think, actually, there's a lot of constructive work being done by industry. It, companies individually uh, have set aggressive goals. I know of some consumer products companies that have set aggressive goals to reduce or eliminate plastic packaging. And there are associations of companies in the plastics world that are working together to address these problems. And, I, and so I think there's a lot going on outside of the sphere of uh, top-down regulation. Uh, and it's companies responding to consumer sentiments and, and pressure from shareholders and the public, uh, just like they are doing in the area of carbon emissions and climate. Plastics has become a public point of conversation and concern. And, and that's creating motion on the industry side as well, which I think is all mm -hmm. to the good. On the industry side, one of the things we've done is not really go down the regulation pathway, but go down the recognition pathway. And, and we have a lot of companies that are stepping up because of their corporate social responsibility policies or just because the owners want to do the right thing. And they have done some pretty amazing things. And the bigger companies, we tend to recognize through the social media channels or the press channels that, that we as DEM um, could get the attention of. So companies like CVS, um, Volvo, um, let me think. I'm, trying, I'm drawing a blank now with all the pressure here. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. so maybe get a Hasbro. Scotch. Hasbro's a big one, Amgen, um, the pharmaceutical company, all these companies have taken very big steps. Citizens Bank have taken very big steps to, um, to become more sustainable and eliminate plastics in their use. We also have something called the Green Hospitality Program. And what that does is it recognizes restaurants and hotels that step up and, and reduce their environmental footprint, either through energy conservation, water conservation, recycling or, or sourcing local foods and products in their operations. And we really kind of stepped up the, uh, the recycling piece to include the elimination of single-use plastics. And this could be anything from a very large, high-scale restaurant in Providence to, to a pizza place in, in a rural town. And if those, if those um, businesses actually step up and go and show us what they've done and they've done a good job. We try and draw attention to them and communicate to their customers that they really are being environmental responsible through a green certification program. Excellent. Can I add something yeah. to that actually? So we also have had quite a bit of engagement over the 10 years of our existence with different companies and corporations and some of them are really great examples and some are have a great component to them and like a horrible component to them as well. Um, I would give an example. One would be that, you know, Starbucks made a big announcement that they were going to phase out plastic straws. Mm -hmm. um, was it last year? Two years. Two years ago, thank you. Uh, but they were going to replace it with adult plastic sippy cup lids. Um, the plastic straw and the, and the lid that it slid through were about three kilograms was it three kilograms of plastic? And the adult sippy cup lid is four kilograms of plastic. I think neither are great solutions, um, but it was nice that they have made a commitment to phase out plastic straws. We're looking forward to watching them mm. implement that. <laughs> um, Marriott made a really big announcement that they were phasing out plastic straws, but uh, we take some issue with their Fresh Bites program that they have in 220 of their hotels that they said they implemented because millennials like it. Um, it is a program where when you order room service, all your food is delivered in like 10 to 13 different pieces of plastic, black plastic with plastic lids. Uh, it, we have some of our coalition members who were very alarmed by that. <laughs> One of them took to Twitter um, complaining. Little Stevie Van Zant from the E Street Band and the Sopranos didn't like that very much. He expects his room service to arrive on a plate, like a ceramic or a glass plate with 
cutlery. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that you know they've done one thing that's in good. They've done another thing that's they have another thing that's still in play that's not great. Um, they know. Uh, and they just recently announced that they were going to consolidate and change the way that they deliver or provide shampoo and conditioner to their customers by putting refillable containers in the shower, so phasing out their single-use small little um, beauty products that they provide. I think that's incredibly positive. We would be the first ones to you know, celebrate wins. I think there, there's a lot to celebrate. We have a long way to go. And I'm still really waiting for that moment when these companies are just going to wake up one day, or maybe it's going to take the CEO or the family or whoever owns it, the board, somebody on the board to sail through part of the garbage patch and just freak out. Um, but it's starting to happen. We're watching it happen. So I think there's a lot, there's a lot more to be done there. But we are seeing glimmers of change. One, th one thing that I could add, just building mm -hmm. off that, is whenever you do regulation or certification programs, you always got to be on the lookout for loopholes and um, and exceptions because somebody will take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. um, with our plastic bag ban, some of the municipalities that came out early on that defined what a reusable plastic bag was by a thickness. So you go from the the, the real skimpy, thin, uh, filmy type bags to a thicker plastic bag. Well, um, some a couple of retailers responded to that by just creating thicker single-use bags, mm -hmm. which is more plastic, right? More throwaway plastic. So that's very much an unintended circumstance. So then what happened was the dialogue shifted to defining what a reusable bag was. And, and the um, sort of like the paradigm that, that people worked on was the fact that a, re, a legitimate reusable bag has to have, have stitches in it. So it has to have a stitched handle. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you've got this durability and and expectation that it's going to last for 50, 60, 100 uses before it starts to have problems. It's not disposable anymore. Well, that's where the wheels came off with the, uh, with the compromise that the task force had developed. And that's where it, it sort of fell apart in our legislature. Mm -hmm. So sometimes these conversations go in weird places that you never expected to. <laughs> oh, if I may, mm -hmm. what I wanted to say is that in the age of consumerism, who is the largest shareholder? Consumers. So as consumers, in re what I like to call reverse free market economy, we should be dictating what corporations are producing. And how do we do that? By not purchasing their uh, uh, single-use uh, products. Mm -hmm. So if we start shifting ourselves, again, changing ourselves to change the world, companies will follow. All they want to do is pro make profit. So they will sell what we want to buy. But if we're just buying what they sell, then we're just part of the problem. But to bring it back to Cherry's question, too, I think that individual action does, it's a ripple effect. You create a ripple effect. You teach your friends. You teach your mm -hmm. family. You engage with people who maybe there's a cafe that you go to when you're working sometimes. You end up having a conversation with people there. And that's how you change the world. I mean, the world's been changed by people, by individuals. Yes. And you have a lot of power. When our task force started to, to meet, I, like I said before, there were about 40 members on a task force. I want to say 15 of us, including me, showed up with their coffee in a polystyrene cup that morning. Wow. That ended fast. Let me tell you. <laughs> you want to talk about behavior change. That, ch that ended fast. And I really haven't, I haven't used too many of them since. I can't say. I went cold turkey, but but cold I've been working turkey. on the reusable cup, and uh, and it does change behavior. There's power in in peer pressure. Thank you, thank you, the panelists. So we as consumers should use our consumer power um, and behavioral change, uh, and keep being skeptical of industrial changes. I want to zoom out uh, a little bit and talk about, and this is my last question before going to the audience question. Zoom out and talk about uh, marine plastics on the global scale. So given that the ocean is not regulated by just one nation, there must be, there's economic and legal challenges in regulating marine debris. So I want to pose the question, are there economic and legal tactics that exist to, to regulate marine plastic pollution? 
Oh, I wish, I wish there were. Uh, I think, uh, as I was saying before, 97% of the ocean is completely unregulated. So they're just swallowing it, whatever we throw. But uh, certainly a, a convention where different uh, member states are parties of, that would change. So that's why, and, and I'm so sorry to uh, tweet my own uh, horn here, but please sign the petition. You want your voice to be heard? This is what we have to do. Let's exercise our right as individuals to protect the uh, global uh, interest. Otherwise, nobody's gonna do it for us. By the time they reach there, what we don't do from here to 2030, we we'll have to triplicate. And I don't think then we'll already be at the point of no return. So there is no regulations for the oceans, and there is no regulation. Uh, it's just starting to kick in some of the regulations for countries. But marine debris in plastics and microplastics, you saw what the difference in microbeads. But then there's the microplastic that in the five gyres that you saw there is like yogurt. How can you pick that up? After this, it's, it's been heated up for years, it's been mushed up like in a, in a washing machine, you cannot even pick it up anymore. It's, it's, a, it's a sludge. So we're not too late, but our window of opportunity is very narrow. Please, take the chance. Exercise your power. Sign that petition. I will, I will mm -hmm. add that, um, yeah, you can zoom up to the, to, the, to the global level, and there's nothing any state can any state, I mean, countries can do this, but there's nothing any state can really do to impact that except, except set an example. And, um, and we want our shorelines to be clean, and that's where you're gonna start, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's what we always focus on is this concept of innovation at scale. We're a small unit, and if we can solve a problem, then we wanna talk to people about how we've approached that and let them borrow it, take it, scale it up, scale it down, whatever you want to do, and maybe it'll work in another different estuary somewhere else in the world or another, or another city or, or state. Can I just add, I agree with what both of you are saying. I think we need to come with pressure from both of those points. But I also, it's really important to understand that when we're looking at this daunting, at the climate change taking place around all of us right now on the planet, Plastic is like, a t it's a tangible uh, example of oil and the petrochemical industry, and it's tangible, and you can see it, and it's in front of you, and you can touch it. And if we want to divest and move away from our dependence on fossil fuel, reducing the amount of single-use plastic and plastics that we depend on and use and utilize is tantamount important. It's, it's just a piece of that whole thing that we're looking at. I also just would like to say that the, the Save Our Seas uh, policy, unfortunately, in DC, you know, there's been a lot of pressure from the American Chemistry Council. And uh, a whole bunch of us signed a letter that we're, we're not happy with where that policy is right now. So I just wanted to let everybody know, although I have respect for Sheldon White House, pardon? Does everybody know what that, what that cost is? You can talk about it if you want to, Jackie, after. How's okay. good? Yeah, maybe just quickly. I, I think it's true that uh, a lot of floating marine plastic ends up in these uh, gyres like the Great Pacific Garbage Patch that is by and large outside of, of state jurisdiction. But most of that plastic doesn't start out there. It comes from shore, comes down rivers. And so it's true that there are derelict plastic fishing nets floating around out there that are causing a lot of damage. Uh, those maybe we can get at by better regulating some of the currently unregulated international fishing activities. Um, but I think the biggest thing we could do to resolve the global ocean plastics, macroplastics issue, is to support efforts, particularly in developing countries, where currently there's very little, if any, good waste management and, and good plastics management, and keep the plastics from coming into the ocean down the rivers and across the beaches in those places. That's attacking the source of this stuff. 
Uh, that's probably the most effective thing we could do. And I would argue that if we consider ourselves as part of the global community and the wealthy end of the global community, stewards of the world's oceans, then we have an obligation, actually, to help make that happen. Hoka, could I add to that? I just think we need to even go one step further upstream, which is really to push for extended producer responsibility. And again, sure. that'll come from policy and legislation so that corporations that decide to package their products, their food products, their beverage products, their beauty products in a particular way are required to take back and be responsible for 100% of that packaging. We don't have that right now. and We need it. I know that I said I just had one more question, but I actually have one more question, <laughs> which is uh, touching upon Hauke's uh, point about regulating the developing country's waste management system. But I want to ask a spicy question and, Ooh, <laughs> and say, <laughs> is it really fair for us to pressure the developing countries when they're the ones who are making the plastic products for us, the developed countries? Well, uh, maybe I'd just clarify. I didn't mean to say that we should pressure them to do anything. I, I'm saying we should pay to make it happen there and support them to You mean put invest in, invest in it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, to, to invest, to give them the capacity to manage those waste streams the way it was demonstrated in the, in the video clip that was shown there. Not, not to go over there and tell them what to do or try to force them to do things. Um, I, think, I think we have better ways of making that happen. Empowering communities, for sure. It's the, the, that, that was a wonderful uh, video showing that. But what I do believe it happens is, so first world countries, now they get public policy. And now whatever they cannot sell here, now we're going to sell it there. So that's their other market. So what we should implement is the same thing as uh, for corruption, for example. So if, if, it's, if it's public policy here, it should be pu public policy everywhere. So how to extend extraterritorial policy to corporations that when they're banned here, they're just going to exploit it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So that can help. But certainly, 80% uh, of marine debris on, on plastics comes from inland. So that's why the Convention of the Law of the Sea has to extend or try to grab other conventions that are inside and strengthen. What's happening with the Paris Agreement? Why are we, f are we failing? Mm -hmm. Because it's willingness. So we're not meeting the, the quotas. So I do believe in binding, binding policy that has also policy without implementation or accountability, it's useless. It's actually prejudicial. So it has to be accountability so that in order for policy to work. I would add too that when we look again at Jenna's, Jenbeck's research, it doesn't matter that these points of release for the plastic are in China and Southeast Asia. What matters is when you do a brand audit and a brand identification, you see that the companies mm -hmm. and the products are being manufactured by US and European corporations. And they are responsible mm -hmm. for all of that packaging and all of the damage that it's doing to the environment there, the ocean, their livelihood, tourism, and human health. Got it. I'm going to open it up to the audience. And I'd like to remind the audience to please keep the question as short as possible. And there should be a question in there. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dr. Karen Weber Salamanca. I'm the executive director of Foundation for a Green Future. And I want to throw a wrench in this discussion. We talk about plastics, but we forget that we have an ecosystem. And so when we try to eliminate plastic, we throw it to glass, to metals, to other things. Um, glass comes from sand. Petroleum comes from old sunshine. You know, whatever we want to look at, it's part of the world. So my concern is, for example, when we get rid of a single-use plastic bag, instead, what are the unintended consequences by not thinking out what our alternatives are going to be? So whatever, uh, my question to you is policy of plastics. Policy of plastics, dot, 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 policy of what is the replacement? What is the alternative? And not just tell people, let's get rid of the plastic bag 
and instead, now we're gonna have GMO cotton that's made by slave labor with toxic chemicals and or plastics that have lead in it or whatever it is that's gonna last for only a certain amount of time or bioplastics that are gonna get into our waste stream or our recycle and contaminate it. So my question to you is, what is your thoughts on it? Uh, yeah. Well, personally, I like to go shopping with canvas bags and baskets. I've gotten a lot of the baskets at thrift stores, so it's reuse. And my canvas bags, I use hundreds, if not thousands of times. I like them. I don't worry if it's made from GMO cotton or not. And uh, there's no comparison for me because I don't use the plastic bags. That's my answer. So two things came up in, in our conversation on plastic bags. One was we started out by saying, all right, no more plastic bags. We're going back to paper bags. Well, paper bags have actually a worse environmental footprint than single-use plastic bags from carbon and, and other, other thresholds. So pretty quickly, we got uh, to what Diana said, which is we need, to, we need to really, really promote the concept of reusable bags. And of course, a good reusable bag is not free. So then you've got low-income communities that need assistance in order to have access to those bags. So the governor committed that if the bag was the bag bill actually passed, we would provide about 500,000 to 700,000 free reusable bags to low-income communities. Um, we weren't sure how we were going to pay for that, but the bag ban didn't pass. So that's for another day. Um, <laughs> The other thing that we talked about, too, is when we talked about banning single-use plastics, we also talked about the idea of maybe not doing a complete ban and trying to drive the, the use of plastics into more easily and appropriately recyclable plastics. Because there's a bunch of them with the high numbers, the sixes and sevens and fives, that kind of stuff, that are not very easily recyclable. If we can get that stuff out of the out of the um, out of commerce, those automatically go to the garbage for the most part, or or to litter or into the ocean or whatever. If we could if we could really complete that circular economy with the PETs and the HDB, DPEs, whatever, um, <laughs> you can kind of you can kind of keep that circle moving for the most part and, and re encourage recycling better. I, uh, yeah, I don't have much to add to that, except to think, if I understood your point correctly, it was about more than just plastic bags. And the fact that when we consider policies or regulations to reduce plastic pollution, we should be careful to think about possible unintended consequences of, of that. And I think that is, that is actually very important. Uh, uh, just to add a little bit, I, I want to play with your imagination for a second. So imagine you're going to the supermarket, right? And the guy tells you, you want to pay $10 for a plastic bag? Or would you like to get $10 in credit to spend in uh, our shop? What are you going to do? I think we're going to choose the second, the latter, right? So we need to motivate through the circular economy or the plastic economy, and then we'll become the water economy, how we save water, and then the fuel economy, how we save uh, fuel. And I think uh, uh, this person who's been speaking in a couple of the panels, uh, John, interesting guy, like the VC guy, and he, 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 was, uh, he was saying that, oh my God, I lost my idea there. But what, what I wanted to, to talk about was the idea of how we can incentivize people to change their behavior. Yeah. And that's where that is going to come about. But there are sufficient uh, reusable materials already made. What we have to stop is making anymore. And then whatever is right there, we can use it on the circular economy. And that circular economy, oh, the fuel, ah, now I remember. Because he said he had that measurable in the smart house on how much water we use. So what if we use his smart application, and now we're paying him also credits for people that say, oh, now I saved on my water instead of how much did I pay? The same thing with the fuel. I got shorter there, I got five people here, we certify five people in one car, how much did, did we get? And we all get gamification immediately through technology on social media. And now, um, let's just say Diane, oh, she got uh, five credits for doing this action or, or not 
taking this other action. And now you want to do it, and now you want to do it. So we have to be creative. Innovation is our answer. And I'm so happy to be here, because MIT, I think, is a school of innovation. I think it's, I think it's an excellent question, though, because it's complicated. It's very complicated, and there's a lot of social and, and technological choices that are in there. 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from transportation, right? When you talk about lightweight plastics, they're saving a lot in transportation. So then you've got to factor that savings and that social benefit, environmental benefit, into the other equation. And now you're looking at what's the worst of two evils. Yeah, but you're not paying the true price of using the plastic, right. which is right. the imp as they're all externalized, the impact to our health. We're just not paying that price. It's I'm an expensive material. Sorry. Sorry, go ahead. I'm getting pressure from the corner. Oh, the boss. The boss. <laughs> so we have time for one more question. <laughs> Let's make it quick. Right. Uh, my name is Mahesh Ramachandran. I'm CEO of Smart Growth Economics. We help communities grow in a sustainable way. So my question is to, I hope I'm saying your name right, Hawk. Okay. Hawk, yeah, yeah. hi. Okay. Uh, so what the charts you showed, and it said packaging is a big contributor of plastic. Another segment of the pie was construction. So I just want the room to just take a look around the visible of the room and just look at the plastics in the room. And think about the polyester, think about the pipes wiring and everywhere in the buildings and everything. Okay. Construction is a huge um, cause for plastic use. So since you showed the uh, chart, I just was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how we build buildings, construction, and the role of uh, plastics, and how we might be able to reduce and build our communities in a sustainable way. Uh, thank you. That's a really good question. I don't, I'm not an expert on construction, honestly, so I'm reluctant to speculate about that. I'm sure there are very good reasons why plastics are used in construction. And I think that it is possible, maybe even likely, that a lot of the plastics used in construction, at least in uh, our society here, don't ultimately end up in the ocean or in an environmentally negative ultimate outcome the way a lot of single-use plastics do. And so, so there again, I think it's, it's a complicated question, and we probably don't want to paint all plastics with the same uh, can of, of <laughs> negative red paint, so to speak. <laughs> there's there's the, the transportation issue that, that was mentioned. There are plastics that are used in cars uh, that if they weren't there, the cars would be heavier and using more fuel. So it may be that we need to think hard about how those plastics are made and how they can ultimately be reused and recycled. Uh, but we're not, we're not going to get rid of all plastics anytime soon, and we probably shouldn't. But I don't think this is a pan an anti-plastic panel. I think this is a panel where we're having a discussion about, you know, how do we measurably reduce single-use plastic or less necessary plastics. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, all, you're also moving yeah. into uh, a huge waste management challenge, which is construction and demolition residuals and debris. Mm -hmm. it's, it's by far one of the largest components of, of waste, solid waste, in the country. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's, it's huge. It's not just plastic. Yep. It's gypsum. It's wallboard. It's, it's brick. It's everything that's in there. And where does most of that end up? In landfills, right? Probably. Most of it. Yeah. Or burnt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. So if you remember a week or two ago in Kendall Square, there was this gory pile of uh, plastic foam <laughs> coming out of buildings. So that was very memorable for me. So let's wrap up <laughs> this policy dis uh, panel discussion. Thank you so much for coming. And th let's uh, thank, thank, thank the panelists you. as well. Yeah.